Hello and welcome back to the channel, Heir of Carthage here, and yes, today is special. Well, for the last while, I have had the opportunity to get hands-on with Total War Warhammer 3. And today, I get to share some of that content with you. Now, what I am allowed to show today, because CA does have like a plan of embargoes and stuff, and I'm sticking to that, so what I can share with you today um, is campaign gameplay from Miao Ying of Cathay and the Demon Prince. So I can share that campaign gameplay um, and I can share up to 50 turns in and I believe I'm allowed to show up to 100 minutes of footage between up to say three videos. But I'm gonna make a couple of videos. I wanna stop talking about this though because I'm wasting video time. I just wanted to make it clear what I can and can't show. I'm going to start up a new campaign and for those of you who are really worried about seeing all the cinematics and stuff for the first time, get ready to skip ahead if you don't want to see it. In fact, I'll try and put a marker in the video so you can just skip ahead. So, spoiler alert, if you don't want to see any of the cinematics, get ready to skip, okay? But I am going to play the cinematics so that people understand what the campaign is about, so that hopefully it puts everything into context. So, a quick a new campaign here, and we're treated to a cutscene. This world has been sundered by a tide of arcane energy. The winds of magic turned into a maelstrom. The Tome of Fate drew me north to find out why. It guided me to a distant fortress steeped in blood. A battle was fought there. Though long over, the spirit still lingered. In the shadow of a broken portal, the trail ended. It was here the tome conversed with the dead. They told of Urson, the bear god of Kislev, lost in darkness. A noble prince ventured to save him, yet he strayed from the path and was corrupted by chaos. Savior became Executioner. A single shot, bound in faith forsaken, pierced Urson's heart. And so the bear god roared. The tide that broke the world. Spirits, where lies Urson now? Is he here? In the north. Beyond the maelstrom, in the realm of chaos, on the forge of souls. Is he alive? Wounded and dying, and restless in shadow. What shadow? A demon's? A master of the dark. <laughs> oh. I knew who shackled the bear. Bellacor. Only a fool would challenge Bellacor. And yet, the power of a dying god, there is no greater prize. A mere drop of Urson's blood would break my curse. Ending my servitude to this accursed book. Free to profit from its secrets. But Urson is locked in the Forge of Souls, deep in the realm of chaos. And I cannot enter this nightmarish domain. All routes have been sealed by the Maelstrom. There must be a way. Ah! <gasps> The tome unveils a spell to summon a portal, one to bypass the maelstrom and create a door into chaos. Knowledge to bargain, for I need an ally, one who is tempted by the power of the god bear and can withstand the horrors within. All right, so here is Miao Ying's um, screen. You can kind of get an idea for what we're going to be up against. Um, I'm going to just leave the difficulty on normal and the battle difficulty on normal. 
This is not a video for me to come in and try and peacock around and show you all how great I am at Total War. The idea behind this video is for me to give you an overview of the campaign and to give you some tips so that when the game does release next month, that you will be able to get a good start in your campaign. So that's my objective here. Overview, breakdown, and tips, right? So that's what we're going to be doing today. As far as lore details, um, we uh, here's the faction effects. I don't want to read them all off. You can pause it and take a look if you want. And then same thing for the lore effects. Um, cause again, I'm limited on time. As far as the map position, there's our starting position on the map. And there are settings that we can pick and go through um, where we can change all this different stuff. I am going to turn off advice because I don't want to hear any of that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and load in and then we're going to be treated to another cutscene here. Grand Cathay, a vast empire to the east, ruled by powerful creatures, dragons, who can inhabit human form. You are gravely mistaken. We have no interest in a mere god's power. No interest in power to use against the forces of chaos? I am Yao Yi, the Storm Dragon. Older than the gods themselves. You are here for a greater purpose. This map shows the energy of all things. There should be harmony, but the world is unbalanced. My younger sister, Shen Tzu, bringer of light and hope. She ventured beyond the Norskan Mountains but was lost. Without her, without her light, darkness prevails, and our family has no comfort. Though I feel your loss, the Tome of Fates provides no insight to your sister's whereabouts. Ursa knows he witnessed her fate. Then why does he not tell you, Iron Dragon? There is mistrust between dragons and gods. If we save Urson, he will tell us how to find Shen Tzu. Let me serve you, mighty dragons. I can reach Urson, lead you to him before it's too late, for one drop of his blood. Your destiny is to guide us. The armies of Cathay must breach the Maelstrom and march into chaos. Balance will be restored to the world when Shen Tzu is returned to you. I am the anointed guardian of the Great Bastion. Any breach brings great dishonor upon me. So prove your worth, mortal. Yes, great matriarch. There is indeed a rupture in the Great Bastion. The forces of Tsinch invade through the ruins of the Snake Gate and have taken the Terracotta Graveyard. Further along, the Bastion remains under threat from the Changer's forces, or, as you know him, the dread power Qian Chi. Yet, despite the enemy assaults, there remain brave defenders ever loyal to you. Bolster them, and they will gladly confederate with a revered dragon. You will need such allies, for it is on the other side of the wall where the threat is strongest. The eternal siege continues, for the dark powers are never sated. And there, the orchestrator of this woe, Kairos Fateweaver. Face this demonic oracle, lest he bring down the Bastion. Fateweaver is insidious, and the invasion is only part of his plan. Rebellion festers in Nanyang's minds under the Changer's malign influence. Punishment must be swift to reinforce your authority. Before we can hope to take the fight into the Chaos Realms themselves, 
we must bring harmony back to Grand Cafe. There is much to do. The bastion can never be breached. All right, and here we are on the map in Grand Cafe with Miao Ying. Now, I mentioned that this video is going to be an overview, a breakdown of mechanics, and then tips. So let's get started on an overview and a breakdown of the mechanics for Grand Cafe. And obviously, as I start playing, I'll be able to give you some more tips. So, how they play. Grand Cafe's unique campaign mechanics are focused around harmony. And that is based on yin and yang, and you can find that right up here on the top toolbar with harmony. There are certain characters, events, buildings, and technology that tip the balance either more towards yin or more towards yang. When the balance is all the way in favor of one of those, it hurts the buildings that benefit from the opposite. However, you still get certain penalties, uh, or sorry, still get certain benefits. So like right now, for instance, I'm in a yin balance, and that means that I get plus 10 relations with cafe, extra growth, uh, construction costs for uh, Yang buildings is lower. Income from Yang buildings er, is up. Um, but income from Yin buildings is down. If you get into a perfect harmony, you can see the effects down below. Um, and it's the best. And so you're always striving, well, should you choose to. You can totally ignore it if you want. But I find it fun um, to try and strive to keep those in harmony. And I'll show you how you do that. Um, so right now we are plus three on yin, meaning that we ought to add some yang if we want to bring things into balance. We have the Wu Jing Compass special um, thing here, which is for Cafe. You can basically choose a direction, um, but you have to, you can only do it every so many turns. So like right now it says we're waiting for three more turns. So here's the Wu Jing Compass. You can point it towards the Great Bastion to get these benefits here. Again, if you want to read that, I'll let you pause it. I don't want to read through all of them at the moment. You can point it towards the Celestial Lake to get those benefits, the Dragon Emperor's Wrath, or the Warpstone Desert. So you point the compass, and basically you choose which one you want to point it towards based on what you need at the moment. So pretty, pretty neat, the compass. I like it. And then you have the Ivory Road. And this is a cool mechanic where it's trade that's supposed to be like the Silk Road was in real life. And you can send caravans down the Ivory Road. You can see we have a caravan here. And it's trying to give me the help screen on the Ivory Road. So I'm going to knock that off, which is good. It's good that they have tooltip overlays and stuff for the first time you go through it. I just started this campaign, so it's showing that to me. You can pick a caravan. And so we're going to, we're going to take these guys here. And we can send them on an expedition. You pick a cargo value, and at first you're rather limited. You can pick all the way up to a thousand, and the more cargo value you have, the more it's worth on the opposite end. The less you pick, the less risk, but the less reward you're going to get. So it's a risk-reward trade-off here. And your caravan is essentially an army, but you can't recruit units to it, not in the traditional sense. And you don't control it directly, again, in the traditional sense, though you will sometimes be taking control of it. We're gonna pick a location, so let's send it over here. Um, so we've set our caravan route. We're going to Frozen Landing. I'm going to dispatch it. It says it's going to take the caravan five turns. At the end of the time where they travel here and back, if we make it alive, and there will be dilemmas along the way most likely, then we will pick up 2,900 for our treasury, even though we only had 1,000 in, so we net 1,900. So this is a way over the next five turns for me to put some extra income into the coffers of my faction. So it's a really neat mechanic, it's fun, it allows you to get some more money and help grow your wealth. So that is the special campaign mechanics. There's one other thing that I want to point out here. Um, we have some initial missions, um, but one of the other things I want to point out is the Great Bastion threat level. Um, so it tells you when the threat level is going high and it helps you know which gates are in ruins and which ones are uh, manned. So right now the Snake Gate is in ruins dragon gate and the other to the north which is the turtle gate are safe um, but that means enemies can now pass through the broken snake gate you can see that the terracotta graveyard is indeed controlled by zinch as we were told now let's kick things off you can see that's our caravan right here by the way it's going to head out you can see i can't recruit to it because that's just not how that works however i do have meow ying here and we're going to get the campaign started now with cafe um you really should be pretty good on money they're 
Their economy isn't insane, but, but at least on the settings I'm playing on, between the caravans, winning battles, and what um, and what economy you do get from Cate, you should be fine in terms of numbers of armies, and hopefully you'll see that as we move in. The initial building they've built here gives me access to iron hail gunners, um, so let's take a look at the build tree real quick. So this is our build tree. Uh, I'd be better served to put in a training camp and get access to um, the jade barracks so that we can unlock uh, jade warriors, jade warriors with crossbows, and then ultimately jade warrior crossbowmen with shield and jade warrior with halberds. Those are kind of the base troops of a Cathay army. There are peasant troops available, and those are peasant long spears and peasant archers. And you can see those come from the hamlet, which is the base level structure. So you can recruit those basically at any time. So at this point, um, we're able to build the next building uh, here available to us. And we have options. Um, the trade building, of course, will give us extra pottery to start trading. That could make us more wealth. Uh, we could put in a defensive building. And there is a, uh, there is a yang and yin version. And remember right now we're balanced towards yin, so we would need to add some yang. And each one has its own benefits. You can see it's a slightly different garrison. The yang garrison is a bit stronger in my opinion. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and put in this yang garrison and we'll start, start to uh, balance off the, the yin that we're in right now. And I'm going to go ahead and this is this building's interesting because it kind of does belong in the main settlement because it goes all the way up to tier 4. I would like to have some more Jade Warriors, but I'm thinking I'm going to put that building in the mines of Nanyang. Emperor Let's go ahead and fight the rebels that are here in front of us. So Witness that's one of our first power. missions. They have a new thing here where you can see the mission up above a settlement or a character, wherever your mission's at. Um, I don't want to waste time on this battle because it's not going to be particularly interesting. Uh, it's easy to win, so I'm just going to auto-resolve. And the options for us after the auto-resolve is we can execute them and get extra leadership for a number of turns. Um, we can restore units by basically putting them to work. Um, or we can harden the captives, replenish slower, and get a little extra cash. I like this venerate option. I feel like it's a pretty good one for cafe yeah, most of the time. Ready to we are now ready to push towards the mines um, of Nanyang. You can see, though, if I get these out of the way... We picked up a staff of Wu Jing here, which is going to give us an augment on the winds. We'll go uh, make sure that's equipped. So if defender. you want to equip any equipment that you pick up, you can come down here to the character details. And this screen's a little different than it used to be, and the staff of Wu Jing is automatically applied, so you can see it's already in the arcane item position there, so we're good. We can't quite reach the mines in the settlement, and we could probably use more troops. So I'm going to click down here on the recruit units, and I'm going to go ahead and call in some more troops. Right now, um, we have one Celestial cro uh, Dragon Crossbowman, which is a very elite, very powerful crossbow unit. we got some Peasant Archers, some Horsemen, a Sky Junk, um, some Peasant Long Spears, Jade Warriors, and a Celestial Dragon Guard, which is a Halberd Infantry. So we have a couple of very elite units, some mid-tier units, and then some low stuff. Um, and we can mix in things here, too. I think I'm going to go ahead and grab an extra Peasant the Long Spearman. And Iron Hail Gunners, uh, yeah, I'll show them to you. Let's go ahead and recruit one of those in as well. Um, they're very deadly over short range, but they are limited in range, and their line of sight can be hampered rather easily. Now, as far as research goes, remember, out here, I built one building that's going to add plus one to Yang. Right now, we're Yin plus two because of putting that building in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go into our research, and some research can uh, switch that too, so you can see this one adds more yin. So let's pick this drill training, which is a yang, and adds leadership for a peasant long spearman. So let's go ahead and do that. Schematics and you can see that um, that'll eventually bring the, uh, the harmony into balance, hopefully, over the next few turns. Storm Dragon. All right, let's grab... Well, we already did the recruiting. Um, oh, we have a... Um, we have an Astromancer here, which is a, a spellcaster for Lore of Heavens. Let's embed that in our army. Fortune can be woven. The now, storm. tips early on with Cathay. Let me go ahead and end this turn. You want to take control of the Snake Gate as quickly as you can. 
And the reason being is there's a building there that greatly reduces the upkeep that you pay for any I'm army that is in its, um, its region. Which basically means you can get a massively reduced cost army. And that's a great death. thing, because you can always have a second army. You're not always having to pay for it. So that's the benefit. Now we're going to go ahead and fight this. Um, this is a little different, because remember that they've added in minor settlement battles in Total War, Warhammer 3. And I want you all to see this, and I want you to see some of the units up close. I've loaded into the battle. Um, you can see that this is fairly similar to Warhammer 2. You can start off by either trying to channel magic, or you can go ahead and start your deployment. We're starting off with a power of 10 and a reserve of 50. Eh, it's not terrible. I'm going to go ahead and start deployment and not mess with it. Now, let's take a look at all the units up close, as I know some people are going to want to see these. So, this is my uh, Peasant Horseman unit. It's a very peasant light horseman. cavalry unit. I'll leave the stats up there. Low armor, um, but quick moving, and gives you an option for running down fleeing units and archers early in the game. So, not a lot of speed for the Cafe roster, and the Peasant Horsemen are a cheap option for it. Here are our Peasant Archers. This guy has decent range at 140, pretty low damage at 15, low Watch armor. Us. Not a very survivable unit, but a cheap unit, and they can output a fair amount of damage if given the time to do so. The step up is right here, or one of the steps up. This is Iron Hail Gunners. You can see that the, they basically use a dragon-shaped blunderbuss. Very short range at 90, but a massive 36 missile strength with AP damage. And remember that these units are not upgraded yet. And here is our Celestial Dragon Crossbowman. This is an AP high armor shielded crossbow unit that actually is decent in melee afterwards. So, very powerful unit here. Um, let's take a look back here. This is our Astromancer. So again, he's going to be our spellcaster for Lore of Heavens. Very cool looking model here. Uh, not great in melee, but that's pretty typical for casters, right? They're more of a support unit. Um, let's move up here to the front line and let you all see these units. So, these are the Celestial Dragon Guard. Really cool elite halberd. You know, I haven't turned on my debug camera yet, so I apologize. Um, so y'all haven't seen them yet. Yeah, this is going to be our Celestial Dragon Guard. And then over here, we've got our Peasant Long Spearman. So a cheap unit there. I'll let you see their stats. I don't know if you all saw the stats on the Celestial Dragon Guard either. So there's the stats on the Dragon Guard. All right, now let's move down the line here. These are going to be our Jade Warriors. These are the sh Sword and Shield variant. I prefer the Halberd variant, and it's because their stats are essentially the same across the board. Except the Halberd variant does also reflect the charge of large units. It causes AP anti-large damage, whereas the sword unit does not. The only real benefit of the sword unit is that it has a shield. And it's not a particularly great shield. It's just a bronze shield, so nothing special there. Another unit of Jade Warriors next to them, and then another unit of the Peasants. But you all haven't gotten to see Miao Ying yet either. So this is Miao Ying before she has transformed into her dragon form. She starts a battle in human form, and as a human, she can cast spells and do better support job. When she transfers into the dragon form, um, she's a little more limited on spell casting, um, but way more powerful in melee. So it's an interesting trade-off that you make. And here's our Sky Junk. Really cool looking model up here, so I'll let you all see that. So that's our Sky Junk. This is going to be a long range um, artillery bombardment platform that's very slow moving, um, but it's going to basically shoot guns and rockets at our enemy. You can see it's got kind of the rocket battery in front and then the gunners. And then uh, let's just check out the map in general, just to give you all a feel. You see that the periphery and the sky box in the map is really very beautiful. So they've made some pretty big strides in terms of how good the game looks from Warhammer 2 to 3, which is really good to see. And then you can see the actual settlement over here. Um, and we'll be fighting into this, and you'll see it um, a little bit more in detail how it works. But remember that the enemy is getting supplies from these supply points. Then there is a key building here uh, that we can try and capture as well. In order to win, we either have to scare out all of the defenders, or we have to um, uh, take a victory point or whatever else it is. So uh, we can deploy in different places in the map, um, but I have really cheap troops right now, and I don't really like the idea of splitting them up too terribly much. So what I will do, though, is I'll just split into two contingents. I'll send one contingent here with fairly elite troops to make sure that they can handle being away from my leader. So I'm going to send in some Rock Celestial Dragon Guard with a Jade Warrior. 
And I'm going to send the Celestial Dragon Guard crossbow with them. And then I'll send the um, the caster with them to support as well. And now on this side, I'll put a slightly larger contingent. Let's see here, I'm going to put our infantry here. And I'm going to I'm gonna keep our Iron Hail Gunners here with some peasants. And I'm going to put our Lord here. And I'll bring my cavalry over on this flank, and we'll keep the Sky Junk with these main units. So we're going to operate in two sections here. So let's go ahead and start the battle. I'm going to move these troops up. You move my Sky Junk up a little bit, again. too. The Sky Junk this should be able um, to start doing some damage to these uh, Jade the Warrior Halberds. So let's go ahead and watch it fire here. Hopefully it'll be able to fire. I haven't been terribly impressed yet with Sky Junks or their lighter weight um, companion, which is the Sky Lantern. Um, there's been some kind of... Like, they don't... Yeah, see, this one says it's it's obstructed, and it's not obstructed. This happens a lot with these, and it's been frustrating. Um, but, you know, I've given feedback to Creative Assembly, and other people have as well, so hopefully we'll be able to work through some of that. We've got the piercing tower here. So you can see the enemy has built a tower. It's shooting arrows at me, even though it looks like its line of sight is blocked. My line of sight's not blocked. We're not shooting. Their line of sight isn't blocked. It's shooting, and it's killing a bunch of my people. So... We need to get in here immediately and engage these uh, Jade Warrior Halberds in order to try and break through them a little quicker. Rather than just throwing these units into melee, let's pull our Iron Hail Gunners up and see if we can get some shots, and then let's let our archers start doing some work as well. And then I have it paused right now. I'm going to unpause it so that we can do this a little quicker. We're getting shot at by some archers over Rock here. Let's man. return fire. And I'm not sure I like the idea of splitting up Move at the moment. These we. units are going to get overwhelmed. So I'm actually going to pull back on this flank for the moment and just get out of their archer range. They have a tower over here, though. That's going to be problems because it shoots a lot farther. All right, our Iron Hail Gunners came up and did manage to push back. Halberds and my Sky Junk finally started firing. There's a tower back here that's shooting at me. I don't have a good way to attack it other than by transforming into the dragon. Ooh, those Iron Hail Gunners, though. They are causing so much damage early on, and that's great. All right, I'm going to send our dragon to go um, attack that tower. Our Sky Junk just shot our own dragon. That was great. Move as I'm going to make sure my skirmish units are turned off of skirmish and on defensive mode so they don't go chasing anything. We are out of firing range over here, so hopefully this will keep some of the attention of these troops. You can see they're actually starting to transfer some of them off, so that's good. We're going to let them do that, and then we're going to push back in. So we need to be patient and break the defenders here. So you can see I'm trying to exercise some patience. Let's watch my Iron Hail Gunners. See, they... I don't think they have line of sight right now because of this little rise right here. So this is, again, the downside to gunners versus bow units. All right, the attack on the tower should be underway. Sky Junk is in range. Iron Hail Gunners are going to get a point-blank volley here, and you can see that it's a blunderbuss with multiple projectiles. So they cause tremendous damage up close. You can see that that uh, Jade Warrior with Halberds is actually going to rout. Alright, so they've routed and we can now move in. There's a sword unit moving towards me. Our Lord just KO'd the tower. I'm going to bring my Lord in to go after these peasant archers. I'm going to start moving my units inside the settlement now. Repositioning! Guided by Let's move our Sky Junk up to help. We'll have to watch out for other towers, though, because the Sky Junk is pretty vulnerable to sustained fire. Not a unit that we want taking sustained fire. See, those peasant archers are now in range. And my dragon is approaching them. So we'll get into melee. I've got to bring my infantry up to cut off these Jade Warriors who are pursuing my Iron Hail Gunners. You can see that the uh, AI just built a barricade here, too. They're trying to get their archers set up on that barricade. Let me go ahead and attack them. I've intercepted the Jade Warriors. I'm going to now position my Iron Hail Gunners to fire into their vulnerable flank. 
Defenders of Cafe. I'm gonna move my archers and my rockets in here. I gave an attack order on those archers, and my dragon's flying away from them, so there's... My dragon is not responding at all to any of my commands. I have not seen that happen yet, so if some of you are wondering if that's a glitch, it must be. I'm gonna go ahead and transform and see if that fixes the move order that was stuck on there. I have not seen that happen. I'll have to report that one. That was rather strange. Oh, the AI built a tower over here. Crap. So the tower is going to be over here just bombarding me. Towers are honestly a bit of a nuisance right now. I don't like the state that they are in. I like that they're in the game, uh, but I have provided some feedback to Creative Assembly that they rebuild too quickly, and the cooldown period after you destroy them is too fast. You can see this tower is almost fully rebuilt. I'm about to have to fight it again. Um, so the frequency with which you're fighting towers, in my opinion, is a bit unacceptable. All right, we've defeated the enemy here. Let's go destroy their barricade. I'm going to take my sky jump forward. Start moving these units forward. Marching as one. I'm going to go ahead and approach and start shooting the tower over here, though, because the tower is causing damage to my troops. And we'll go ahead and charge in here, too, and try and catch the enemy um, from two different sides. And soon, the cooldown on my lord should be done, and I can switch back into dragon. I didn't actually want to change, but wasn't really given an option. There was some kind of strange glitch going on there. So that's actually the first time I've seen that glitch. I have to go report that one. This is an early release copy of the game. They got it to us quite early before release. And so that kind of thing does happen. They have a feedback forum where we go and provide them feedback. Overall, I have not been experiencing a ton of glitches. But it is a new game, so I do expect there, there will be some uh, challenges and glitches. There always, there always is. All right, so we're going to break down their barricade. My Sky Junk has come on through. I'm wanting it um, to go ahead and shoot these Jade Warrior Crossbowmen. I'm lucky those Crossbowmen are not shooting at my Sky Junk. Because they could kill it rather quickly. Alright, instead I'm raining down death. I'm going to transfer, or sorry, transform. So we've transformed. Let's get into melee with these Peasant Long Spearmen. We'll try and outflank them as well. Tower is destroyed, at least for now, so let's move up our crossbowmen. We're about to pull down the barricade platform, and you can see that my Sky Junk made very quick work of these Jade Warrior crossbowmen with their rockets. And my Lord has transformed back into a dragon. I'm going to go attack this tower again, see how quick it comes back. But if you leave the towers alone, see there's another tower here too, so I'm getting shot by two different towers. Got a unit approaching us that regrouped. It is rerouted, fortunately. Barricade is nearly destroyed. And we're ready to outflank over here. Let's take our cavalry. There's a capture point right here. Let's go capture that. I would have assumed there would have been a capture point somewhere that's tied to the tower that would keep them from being able to rebuild it, but there's not. Anything for the strange. The dragons. This crossbowman came back from routing, and my sky junk is continuing to rain death on them. We just took Never down their barricade. Turn. We can now move freely up to the interior of the settlement where we're going to find the enemy leader. So I'm going to begin that movement process. Another tower down. I'm going to go take down this tower again. Like I said, the towers have been a nuisance. I, they need to be changed. They they come back too quickly. That's just my impression so far. I like that they're in the game. I like what they add to the game. But unfortunately, right now, I think they need some tweaks. Before the, oh, they've got a... As a horseman. Come at me. Let's counter charge. Send some halberds over to support. I don't know whether we'll win that fight. It's similar Stone units fighting. Dragon God. Sent by dragons. Praise the dragons. And move our sky junk this direction. This tower is almost destroyed. But you can see it's taking me so long to destroy the tower that this one will be rebuilt. Um, about 20 or 30 seconds after I finish destroying that one, so it becomes kind of a 
goofy Benny Hill chase music type of thing with you running around. You might be like, well, Eric, just ignore the tower. They cause you immense damage, um, so you really can't ignore them. We had equal units here, but theirs defeated me badly. So I'll come and challenge that with my Alberts, and we will easily win that. Alright, so I've got my forces moving towards the key building. And I've got my sky junk moving in as well. There's the enemy hero. Let's go start attacking. It's just an astromancer. So we should be able to take them in melee pretty easily. Alright, my units are moving up here as well. The uh, peasant horseman was slaughtered by my uh, celestial dragon guard. Not a big surprise there. Alright, there we go. Just trying to get you all close up on this celestial dragon guard. Let's go ahead and roll them up here, but the camera wasn't quite cooperating there. Alright, the enemy astromancer has been engaged by the storm dragon. Animation's a little bit wonky there. The attack animations are kind of cool, but the animation getting set up for the attack is a little bit weak. There we go, we gained a victory. So we fought our way through the defenders, not without loss, but successfully. You're going to take losses when enemy towers are firing at you, and it should be that way um, in a battle like that. The defenders should have some advantages. So again, I don't feel like the towers should be removed by any means. I just want to see their cooldown time either doubled or tripled. I think that should mostly fix it. Yeah, that's our first battle. Um, hopefully you learned a few things about how to get in um, and take an enemy settlement there. Uh, honestly, just try and split the defenders. Take advantage of situations like right there. I had Iron Hail Gunners, and they were countering me with the Halberd. That's a bad counter. Um, so I made them pay for it, and then that gave us easy entry into their settlement. So... Just be patient with the AI. They're actually, they defend the settlements better than I thought they would because AI typically struggles with that type of thing. Um, and I, I didn't expect them to be great. But they defend the settlements, like like I said, better than I thought they would manage to do. But um, you can still find ways to take advantage of them. And that's what we did right there. We took advantage of a matchup that they the didn't properly defender. account for. So they have a cavalry building started here, but we don't want cavalry. We want that jade barracks. So I'm going to tear that down. Favorite and I'm not going to recruit anything. Well, we could go ahead and do a little bit of recruiting. I'll go ahead and grab one peasant Serve long spearman. Serve the emperor. Actually, I want jade warriors instead. So let's, let's get an iron hail gunner and a peasant bowman. For now. To There's nothing else I can do for this turn, so we should end the turn. And we're going to go through our first turn here. And you can see our caravan has already had an encounter. And we can pay some money. Now remember that we, I think we risked like a thousand. In total we were going to get 1900 profit. And we can pay 500 and agree to the deal to stay on a safer route. Or we can keep to the established route at risk of, um, you know, being more dangerous. Meaning, if we pick the top one, we're not going to have to spend the money, but there's a higher chance we're going to get intercepted. Right now, I don't want my first caravan to get killed. I want them to be able to get stronger, so I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice a little bit of my profit margin here to try and keep my guys alive. Okay? I'm going to make that choice. I think yeah. we either got some missions to get some equipment. Yeah, we got a mission to go pick up some equipment. We have an enchanted item here. It's the Feather Foe Tor. It's not very good, but we'll go ahead and use it. We finished our recruiting, and now we can build a uh, jade barracks, our uh, training camp here. Jade barracks, the dormitory, and the, finally the jade barracks. So let's do that. The I want those in place. See our yin and yang balance now is one on the side of yin. And we're about to finish our research in a couple of turns, which should bring it totally into balance. Storm Dragon, Warden of the Great Bastion. Now at this point, um, if we look the at the rest of the settlement, Nan Li, 
It is the last um, settlement in this province, and it's the last place that rebels exist. Ready to defend. So we probably want to go ahead and push forward and Acceptable. take them out of commission. Our Jade Barracks isn't finished, but you can never have too many units, and we have the money for it, so you should go ahead and recruit additional units. You can always replace them the with better ones defend. later. So, I'm going to end our turn, and then we're going to approach Nanli. We want to consolidate this entire province as quickly as possible, so that we don't leave it um, open to counterattack. We got this uh, mission to go pick up a special standard of Nangao, which will increase the range of one of our range units. All right, our barracks is ready. We can actually build up to a village here as well at Nanyang. We're going to do so. And our army is ready to approach and try and defeat the enemy at Nanli. And that is where one of our missions is at. We can auto-resolve here. It says we're gonna take medium casualties. None of my units are flashing though, so if, if you're gonna lose any of your units from the auto-resolve, you would see it over here. Let's go ahead and run that auto-resolve. successful. Let's occupy. And now I'm going to skip a few turns and I'm going to not record this part and I'll come back in with the recording and show you how we're going to go try and rebuild the snake gate. But I am limited on time so I'm going to skip a bit of play here. I did want to show you all the Wujing compass which is now ready. Um, there's options I can pick here. Casualty replenishment rate would be pretty handy right now. Uh, but then there's also this Dragon Emperor's Wrath down here, which when it gets full, any enemy armies that have come through the Great Bastion start to take big time attrition and we gain more control over our provinces. I could kind of use the, the replenishment rate right now though, so I'm gonna point it at the Great Bastion so that we can try and improve that. All right, I will come back when we are closer to the Snake Gate. Another tip that I think it's important to give you all, sometimes when your caravan master levels up, you can make them better. There's a lot of choices here, right? Do I pick this top tree and try and go for that? Do I improve the fighting capability of my units? Do I improve the fighting capability of my caravan master here? But what I would recommend going for first is wayfinders. Now remember, a caravan is an army you don't directly control. It's marching down that trade route, and if you get ambushed, it's extremely difficult to fight your way out of it. So by picking Wayfinders, you start automatically to reduce your ambush chance massively. And this is most likely going to result in you not losing your caravan where you otherwise would lose it, and then you don't lose that veterancy and all the skill points that you pour into them, and you also don't lose the money in the cargo. I'm going to pick Wayfinders here, so I wanted to share that tip with you. I have found it to be very useful so far. Now, we finished our research as well. Um, we're still not quite in harmony here. We're one to the side of Yin. So we need one more thing to kind of tip the scales uh, towards Yang in order to bring things into perfect harmony. So let's go back in here, and we need to pick one more Yang tech, and this one right here or this one here will do it. This one adds growth to all provinces, which is a pretty good thing to pick early. For the defense let's effort, do that. I am recruiting some more troops, and we are moving towards the Snake Gate. Favored. Now, we can see there are some enemy armies coming in. Another tip here I'm going to give you, and this is a general Total War Warhammer tip. If I move forward, these armies are likely to just run away from me. And Ready they'll run around, and they won't want to fight you, and they're going to be extremely annoying to catch. There, something you need to take advantage of is the stance of your army down here. And the stance in particular I want to show you right now is the ambush stance. It takes 25% of your movement points in order to adopt it, but it hides your army from the enemy army's view, and so what they're going to see is unguarded settlements down here, and the AI is drawn to those unguarded settlements like a magnet. So, I'm going to position my army closer to these two enemy armies where hopefully I can attack them, <coughs> but I'm going to leave more than 25% of my movement points so that I can enter this ambush stance. The AI won't be able to see me, and we're going to get them to make a mistake. Let's see if it works. I have a lot of good success with this. It doesn't always work, but it does work sometimes. Let's go ahead and build up to the village here. Let's see what this building's doing. This one is generating income. It's not really the building I want. I want something for growth, so I'm actually going to tear that down, and that actually should bring me into balance when I tear it down. And we'll get to see what that looks like. Ah, uh, you can see that army of Zinch there could not see us. And then we did manage to 
these guys didn't fall for our ambush because we're not ambushing them. But um, we are going to get an opportunity to fight them here. And I'm not, I don't have time for this because I'm almost out of time on here, so I'm going to auto-resolve this. It's going to be a good battle for us, relatively low. And we're going to use this Venerate in order to replenish our units as much as we can. We're in friendly territory, so we picked up turn-in replenishment as well. See, now that leaves me within striking distance of the Zinchian army over here as well. So we just eliminated two armies on that single turn-in, and we leveled up. I like picking, um, and this, this is just me, so you can take this tip or you can leave this tip. You can go for magic first, you can go for whatever you want first. I like doing unyielding and sure aim, because this makes my peasants, jade warriors, and celestial dragon guard all better in combat. And this is going to be a freebie, basically. You want that because you're going to be using those units in your army, guaranteed. And same with this one. As an archer, celestial dragon crossbow, jade warrior crossbows all get uh, more damage and more range. So I like running these upgrades first because it makes my units much more powerful and much more effective in combat. At the units are not terribly impressive in combat, and so you want those buffs. And anything you can do to buff them, they start to become an excellent value. I like Curse the Midnight Wind early on my Astromancer here because it's a really nice debuff on enemy attack and defense. It makes them very vulnerable in melee. Again, Cathay is not tremendously good in melee, so we want to get all the benefits we can. See, the Zinchian army is going to run away from us. I don't think I can quite catch them. Actually, yes, we can. Good, so we're going to take Zinch out here too. And that is successful. We're going to do the venerate here. And now we are ready to end another turn. I was going to go recapture the snake gate, but we really need to get the terracotta graveyard first. Because otherwise Zinch is going to keep spawning armies out of it. Alright, we can get the end of sure aim. And now that I've completed unyielding and sure aim, what I like to do is pick route marcher to get the extra campaign movement range. And we're going to work our way up towards lightning strike. Lightning strike is very, very useful. And making sure that if there's multiple enemies in front of you, you can fight them one at a time. It's a very, very useful tool. Take advantage of I'm going to grab a war horse here for our Astromancer, make him faster around the battlefield. We've got some buildings we can put in. <clears throat> we are in harmony. We're going to not be probably here soon unless I do things right. You can see that harmony is giving us extra income, control, um, fighting back against corruption, all that good stuff, okay? So we are in harmony. This is good. <clears throat> and you want to try and be in harmony as much as you can. I'm going to go ahead and improve to the dormitory here because then that gives us Jade Warrior Crossbowmen as a recruit option. We definitely want those. And then there are two buildings that can give you growth. One is Yang and one is Yin. And they have slightly different benefits, but they both give you growth. And I like the growth buildings. So what I'm going to do here to try and maintain the balance is I'm going to pick one Yang and one Yin. See, I'm going to go opposites here and try and keep that balance. Let's go ahead and end our turn again and get ready to go take the Terracotta Graveyard, which I don't know if it'll quite be in range on the next turn, but it should be close. Ready to defend. <laughs> it is in range, and Zinch doesn't have much of a defense in terms of their army. Now, the garrisons in this game do seem a bit larger. You see, he's got a lot of Forsaken and Horrors. But hey, the auto-resolve is going to be pretty nice to me here, and sometimes when the auto-resolve is being nice to you, because remember, there's towers and all kinds of stuff, just take it. Don't we argue. Defend, I mean, unless you're really stubborn. So there we go. We're now in control of the Terracotta the Graveyard. Picked up a sword of anti-heroes for our trouble. Let's yeah. go in here to the character details. You can see that we've got the Sword of Striking. This little warning pops up when there's something that's potentially better out there, and the Sword of Anti-Heroes has a nice damage dealing components. We'll get it. And we've also got a Forbidden Rod here, but, you know, that's not anything I'm particularly interested in. We do have this um, Frost Worm Skull, but that's on our uh, caravan leader at the moment. So the I Terracotta Graveyard is ours, and that just leaves the Snake Gate that we need to resettle. Let's run our upgrades. Storm Dragon. Again, I'm going to go towards Lightning Strike, but in order to get there, I have to unlock um, four points over here first. Now, I like using this one, Reassuring Presence. It reduces attrition that your army suffers when you get in an attrition zone. It's going to be a great way of making sure that your army still stays in good fighting shape, even when you have to move through a Chaos Waste or, you know, Vampiric Corruption, whatever else it is, right? So I'm going to do that. Rannon's Thunderbolt is also pretty handy at cleaning up um, 
blobs. So we're going to pick that too. So again, these are just general tips I'm giving you that I think are a good way to go. It's not the only way to play the game. Um, got a diplomacy thing going. I haven't showed diplomacy yet, but that'll be a deeper discussion for another day. Let's go ahead and accept this. It's a trade agreement with the Iron Dragon. We want that. Now the balance has shifted towards Yang because I completed my uh, research. That's okay. We're just going to research uh, a Yin technology. A extra ammunition is fine. That'll be the useful. Celestial Empire ever improves. And we're going to move towards the Snake Gate. I'm going to stay just inside my own territory. We can't reach the Snake Gate. If I stay inside my own territory, we'll continue to replenish. There's an enemy out here. Multiple enemies, in fact. And if you recapture the Snake Gate, they're going to be able to attack you when you're weak after you spent your population um, to resettle the gate. So just something to bear in mind. I'm going to build up these two buildings to give us even more growth in this province. And then I'm going to go ahead and build... This is how I like to build the small provinces. I put in a stockade. Um, you want as good a defenses as you can have in these small settlements because the AI targets them frequently. And if you don't want to lose them, take the time to build those protection allies. buildings what to increase your garrison size. Another trade offer here from the north. We'll take it. And it looks like the enemy armies, one of them moved up into an ambush stance. Warden of the and is standing Great just on the other side of that gate. I, I saw him move up and then he disappeared. No, he came all the way through the gate. If I resettle the gate right now, those armies are probably going to catch me off guard. If I attack him, he's going to run away. So, a bit of a precarious position. The Emperor's Just for the sake of teaching you all, um, honestly, I probably wouldn't settle this gate if it were by choice. I would probably go and start trying to mop this guy up, let some more people, but you can see there's another army headed this way. I do want to control this gate. So, let's go ahead and colonize. This is going to be kind of risky because our, you can see our army is considerably weakened, but our, our Dragon Lord is so strong she can probably hold the gate for us but now that we've captured the gate this is the last part of the video and a tip i wanted to show you there's a really cool building you can do you immediately want to build that up but if we take a look at the build tree in the gate settlements it's different than a typical settlement and this tree right here see that upkeep for local armies all the way at the top it's 65 percent reduction and a huge campaign line of sight build this building you can recruit a second army and have them sit in the gate and get a massive upkeep cost reduction, which allows you to continue to make money while having that second army, which is normally prohibitive. And then you can bank that money. And if you ever move them away from the snake gate, you may go into the negative, but you'll have enough built up to where you can resist it. So this is the first building I like to build. Hopefully that's some good tips for you all on how to start your Miao Ying campaign. I will show you more campaign gameplays soon in the future. I have lots of plans on it, so make sure you stay tuned. And like I said, stay tuned later. I'm going to have a little bit of a dive into the Demon Prince, which I think you all are really going to enjoy. So hope this was useful to you. Make sure and go down to the comments. Tell me what you think of the game. Ask me any questions you have. If it's anything I can answer, I will answer it. Some things are still under NDA, but anything about that I showed you today... I can answer that, and like I said, anything else you ask me that I can answer, I will do my best to do so, so please ask it. Air of Carthage, signing out for now. I will see you all soon with some more footage from Total War Warhammer 3.